minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street and there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. My life has value. tools used in the process of erasing our history is what we know as lunatic asylums. Now, if you're new to this topic, most people when they think of lunatic asylums, they think of the movies or what's now called psychiatric hospitals for people with severe mental disorders. There's definitely multiple levels to this topic, and we have the dark side which goes into these institutions not attempting to heal these problems in any real or holistic way. And so the main approach to these health problems involves suppression through drugs, which does not fix the issue and in most cases just makes things worse. I'm sure many of you guys have seen the movies where someone's put into these mental institutions and they're completely sane, but they're not able to escape for whatever reason. It could be the institution is attempting to keep you hostage for experimental reasons and or you have been deemed to be insane simply for going against the establishment. It could also be that you're sane, but the institution the outside world perceives you to be insane for your beliefs, such as schizophrenic patients who tend to communicate with other worlds. These institutions have a history, and most of these old asylums are these Tartarian, old-world-looking buildings that have been taken over and repurposed. You find very similar themes with the same common story, 
and they all use similar terminology, such as being founded or established in 1804 or 1820, but what if these were not created during the 1800s, but were actually taken over after some type of reset? Many of the dates that they give us can be easily manipulated as well, but for the most part, the oldest asylum is in Virginia, and it was founded in 1773. So, most of these all started popping up around the 1812 to 1850 Civil War time period, and they actually used that as an excuse for why they needed to create even more of these institutions because people were insane after the war and they needed these institutions as places of refuge. History attempts to paint these asylums in a positive light, but what if it's the complete opposite? In order to understand this, make sure you've seen the other videos on Tartaria Explained, including the one on the Civil War, which had nothing to do with slavery and was really a movement of power from the old world to the new cabal that had taken over temporarily. It's thought that the cannons were really used for destroying old world buildings and the mass wealth that was accumulated outside of the cabal's control. Once we establish that, we can see that one of the main tools for controlling those who may resist the new reset or still have memories of the past society would be to throw them into a mental asylum and heal them for being against the establishment. In England, this probably took place before it was moved into the Americas, but there was a device specifically created for mind control and erasing memories of patients. Like I said, we really need to start in London before we move to America as it really explains that this has been going on for a while and it's strategic. We're going to take a look at the Bethlehem Hospital and there's some weird stuff going on here. First of all, if you search for Bethlehem Hospital, the modern picture is not even the original location. The original location was turned into the Imperial War Museum. And funnily enough, the word Bedlam actually means confusion. And notice how the cannons are right in front of the building, as if to say that these institutions created confusion and erased the old world. If we look at the history of this place, it gets even stranger. So the Imperial War Museum isn't the first location of the building either. The hospital was founded in 1247, and it was never intended on being a hospital. It was originally designed to be an institution aimed to support the Crusader Church and link England to the Holy Land. We get a bunch of history from 1200 to the 1600s about the place being used as a medieval hospital for the needy. And as we get into the 1600s, there was a movement from the medieval style of each patient having an old style keeper physician to take care of them to the new system, which essentially involved a bunch of wealthy aristocrats starting their own hospitals that would later be termed madhouses as their healing methods were far too aggressive. There would be one physician residing over the entire institution with a visiting surgeon and drugs were given to the patients in order to heal them of their illnesses. What ended up happening was a medical regime in which medical practices were being generalized across all patients, and the result was extreme violent medical practices that would induce vomiting and avoiding of the bowels by force. We really only have the basic plans of this building, but in 1667, the hospital was moved to Moore Fields, which I find very interesting. Like, why is it called Moore Fields? And did they really move it, or was this structure already here? They keep moving because they are damaging these buildings beyond repair. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense to constantly keep reconstructing buildings at this level. Moore is in a lot of old architecture and city names in England, so it is very interesting. But let's take a look at what this place looked like. I mean, this is pretty massive. They're trying to tell us that it took them only a year to make this, which, if you ask me, that's some BS. So 100 years passed by, and by the end of the 18th century, the hospital in Moore Fields was supposedly deteriorating with uneven floors, buckling walls, and a leaking roof. So remember, they didn't really build this, so they used it for 100 years, and then after 100 years, they essentially destroyed the place, and in 1791, a report was sent to the governor listing 800 pounds of damage, which would be around 1.2 million pounds today. And sure, that's a lot of money, but it would cost way more to build an entirely new building, especially the one that we see today with the Imperial War Museum. But regardless, they say it was beyond repair, and so they moved to St. George Fields. And yes, they want us to believe they did all this on horse and buggy. Yet, today, the modern hospital is so small. You would think such an institution with a long history would try to preserve it by having somewhat of a nice modern building. That's just the history for this one asylum. They all have this theme. 
Now, we went to this one specifically because there's some crazy stuff that went on here. There was this guy named James Tilly Matthews. He was a London tea broker who is basically the first documented case of schizophrenia. In the 1790s, concerned at the likelihood of a war between Britain and France, Matthews, who traveled to France, was a part of some type of resistance or the Gerundist, which were attempting to end the monarchy. Whether he was working as a spy for the English is questionable, but after spending time in France, he was accused of being associated with these Gerundists, which the French establishment at the time used the whole reign on terror as an excuse to imprison their enemies and to continue their agenda of control. So Matthews was thrown in prison, and after three years, the French authorities concluded that he was a lunatic and released him. When he returned to London, Matthews wrote two letters to Lord Liverpool, complaining about conspiracies directed to him, and during some debate in the House of Commons, he yelled treason. Now, I don't know if that's completely true, who knows, but basically, the officials arrested him and placed him in the Bethlehem Hospital in 1797. After examination, he declared that he had taken part in secret affairs of state in reference to his efforts in France. After 10 years in the hospital, his friends and family petitioned for his release on the grounds that he wasn't insane. His family hired their own doctors, Matthews was re-examined, and he was declared sane. But this is when it gets really crazy. A year after he was released, a man named John Haslam produced the book Illustrations of Madness, in which he intended to settle the dispute over Matthews' sanity. Essentially, this book is what ends the debate on what really happened with Matthews. It shares his story and paints him as a lunatic, even though the author does attempt to stay unbiased. But here's the thing, even though there are some elements to the story that may be caused by some type of schizophrenia, it's likely that this was purposely induced as he knew way too much information. What do you think they did to him for 10 years in the hospital? So essentially, this was made to make this information look like complete insanity, when really, there may be some truth to it. Let's remember that during this time, asylums were mainly vehicles of the state. So Matthews believed that there was this gang of criminals and spies skilled in pneumatic chemistry. This gang would torment him by means of rays emitted by a machine called the heirloom or gaseous charge generator. They put James Matthews in Bethlehem Hospital because he knew of the secret war machine that was used by these French revolutionaries, which we can ask who were these revolutionaries and is there something else going on with that story? But essentially, 250 years before the CIA's failed brainwashing experiments, somehow French revolutionaries in France had created a mind control machine in Death Ray. Is this another setup revolution similar to the Bolshevik revolution that was a counter operation? James somehow found himself mixed in the middle and only due to his family, he luckily got out and left us with the only known knowledge of these devices. Who knows, these could be even older and explain how many other cities were taken over behind the scenes. But in his very descriptive explanation of the machine, Matthews explained that these machines had been deployed all over London, secretly, in cellars. The heirloom was enormous, it stood 7 meters tall, and it was surrounded by barrels that fed noxious gases through oiled leathered pipes into the main body of the machine. The gases were derived from substances including gas from the horse's anus, seminal fluid, and putrid human breath. The heirloom used magnetically charged air particles that could be directed towards its victim in order to induce the effect of mesmerism. Of course, we don't take mesmerism seriously today in modern science. However, this was not the case during this time period, and obviously there was an advanced machine capable of inducing these effects, so who's to say that these people can't do the same with their minds? But regardless, the machine needed to be operated by a certain amount of members who each had their own name and duty, as described by Matthews. The main body of the machine had a number of keys, levers, and brass retorts. These were used to modulate the flow of magnetically charged air that was emitted from the machine. Skillfully combined sequences of the various levers and keys could produce different types of air current, which could be directed towards the victim to assault them with a whole arsenal of psychological and physiological effects. Essentially, this was some type of instrument, and an art at that, as someone would basically play it as a piano and magnetically charge the air current with the intention of directing it towards the victim to assault them. One of these effects were called kiting, where an idea is forced into the thoughts of the victim, which undulates in the intellect for hours together, and how much soever the person assailed may wish to direct his mind to other subjects, he finds himself unable to do so. 
Similarly, thought making. This game could literally suck the thoughts out of a victim out of their head and replace it with any subject they choose. They had an effect called lobster cracking, in which the external pressure of the magnetic atmosphere surrounding the person assailed was increased so as to stagnate his circulation and produce instant death. They also interestingly talk about nutmeg, which is also known to give a psychedelic reaction to those who are allergic. They must have known that it could be used as a suggestogen. There are even depictions of the number of controls this machine had, multiple parameters for a variety of different settings. Now think about it, if this was just a delusion, then how is it possible to have such a detailed description of this device? There's a reason that this machine is not commonly known, and it's because these devices have been used on populations throughout history in order to cause amnesia, control popular narratives, and to take over societies. If they use this politically, who's to say they don't use this in other areas? What if this explains the industrial revolution and having all this cheap labor where you had these people working in bad conditions and yet they still stayed? The story is that they were poor and they had to, but what if there was some type of device in the cellars of these old mills that induced specific thoughts like being a hard worker because you have to? Now, there is another part of this that we will cover briefly. Basically, when you look up influencing machine, what you have is all these educated mainstream scholars concluding that the heirloom and other mind control devices are just visions of schizophrenics. But not just that, but there's even something more profound to get from all this, that the influencing machine is some deep subconscious archetypal trope. Now, I'm not saying that this can't happen to someone with schizophrenia, but I am very suspicious of this public opinion and that these are all simply hallucinations of madmen. First off, isn't it convenient that the first schizophrenia patient ever just so happens to have the most detailed engravings of this machine and no one at this time had been discussing any technologies like this in public literature so there was no way he just imagined this out of nowhere. They literally built a working replica of the machine. It wasn't just a delusion. This was influenced by some type of event and this wasn't just with James Matthews. There have been several counts of artists depicting these types of devices, but they're just labeled as insane. Or they just try to decode this as some deep Jungian philosophical symbolism when, really, there may be multiple things going on. Spiritual forces that influence these peoples, and or physical devices that actually do exist and influence the thoughts of their victims. There are actually quite a few depictions of these, and of course, it's not to say that every one of these is real, but... This idea of a mind control device is obviously prevalent in our psyches and sure you can take the psychiatrist approach and just say it's an aspect of our deep subconscious or whatever and i'm sure that does play a part but it's not the meat of the subject all the scholarly work on the subject tends to take this viewpoint however as many of you are thinking these types of devices have existed for who knows how long but they're not just fantasy and they've been around far longer than just the heirloom you would most likely think there would be an attempt to develop a mesmerism device and or mind control device in the 18th century because hypnotism was believed to exist. That being the case, you would think that powerful people would look into creating a mind control device with the advancement of technology and electricity during the 18th century. Even in ancient societies, psychedelics and suggestogens have been used as means of controlling one's mind. What resulted in the 18th century was a fairly simple machine to construct that was advanced to operate and would go to work behind the scenes, influencing public suggestion and controlling the minds of anyone who'd resist the establishment. This device would also allow for creating amnesia in a new population. Interestingly enough, there's a game called Amnesia. I'm sure most of you guys know about Dark Descent, but there's another one called A Machine for Pigs. There's this artist who composited everything as one map, and it's really interesting to look at because you have the same type of heirloom device and you see this happening on a mass scale with it coming out of the factories and there's a Tesla coil in the background as well, magnetizing the currents. There's actually a lot of weird stuff with this game. You have the old world Tartarian buildings and there's also this thing about absinthe, which again, that gets into psychedelics. But yeah, I just thought it was really weird. I mean, a lot of these illustrations seem to be depicting some kind of hidden past or maybe they know something that we don't. Also, I want to give a shout out to Paul Cook as he had some really good research on this topic, so make sure to check out his channel. If we return to America with that in mind, and I mean, that's just the surface of what's gone on throughout history at these hospitals. 
it gets much darker, but for the most part, we can begin to question the narrative behind these structures as it's the same theme with most of them. The narrative just doesn't really add up. Most of these asylums are really big and their architecture is quite advanced for its time considering the tools they had. Also, the population was too little at the time to construct these structures, and many of them were built in just a few years. Let's keep in mind that the first general hospital in America is the Pennsylvania Hospital, which was founded in 1751. So let me get this straight. They're building these massive structures in cities out of nowhere. Philadelphia started in the early 1700s, and they don't even think about creating a general hospital for over 50 years. The oldest asylum is the Virginia Eastern Lunatic Asylum, which no longer exists as it was destroyed in a very convenient fire in 1885. According to the depictions, it looks to be an old world building that is slightly buried beneath the ground. This building only took two years to build according to the story, as it was established in 1771 and the first patient was administered in 1773. The second oldest asylum is the Spring Grove Asylum in Maryland. Again, it looks very similar. Now, it started off as a general hospital in 1797, but it actually can trace its roots to an institution three years earlier. Basically, it was a men's club headed by a sea captain named Jeremiah Yellett established what they called a retreat for the ailing mariners of Baltimore. Hmm, that kind of sounds weird to me, but that's how it began as some private men's club and then became a hospital for strangers and mariners. The hospital for seamen and strangers. It seems that the hospital was actually funded by Captain Yella and his associates. So the story is that the club evolved into a hospital as a way to take care of the mariners who had many medical conditions such as nutritional diseases. They referred to many of the patients as inmates, and it seems that there is something else going on with this supposed retreat. Basically, it could have been a means for mind-controlling newcomers who came by sea and labeling them as insane if they do not fit the narrative. At the time, Maryland's mentally ill were called inebriates and or being mentally retarded. Now, they didn't have a word for being mentally insane, maybe because it wasn't really prevalent until after the reset, so of course, they had to create this narrative. The Northeast Coast is home to America's oldest ports, at least from the mainstream sense and where these old world cities first started to be taken over, right? Like the West of America wasn't conquered until like, after the Civil War, so. The Northeast must have started these reset plans very early on, programming any immigrants who may be trying to relocate. So in 1797, the hospital had a new purpose, for the reception and care of lunatics, or really, anyone who didn't fit the narrative. Let's also keep in mind that yellow fever epidemic happened around this time, and I just wonder if this was also done with intent. Now that we understand they had a mind control device using magnetized air currents, you would think that maybe they know how to spread disease using similar methods. Of course, the excuse is mosquitoes were breeding in the wetlands and because of warmer climate, this led to a number of these outbreaks. That doesn't really make sense as the Native Americans never suffered from these issues, so there's definitely something else going on when it comes to all this sickness, the sudden need to create all these hospitals out of nowhere, which really should have been constructed from day one in any well-planned city. Unless, of course, they didn't have any need for hospitals, but that's another can of worms. Basically, in 1808, the state took over the building, and they decided to do $40,000 in repairs, which, that's a lot of money at that time. And the story goes that they got this money because a bunch of lottery winners donated back to the state so that they could expand the hospital. Right? That makes sense. Okay, this is when it gets crazy. So in 1813, during the War of 1812, an admission to the city hospital could be ordered or authorized by the chancellor of an entity known as the Chancery Court. As the head of this court, the chancellor had the authority to commit to the facility those individuals who were referred to by the law as any lunatic, idiot, or person insane. Acts of 1813. So within 10 years of creating this hospital, which was started and funded by a boys club, the state takes over and creates a law that they can basically put anyone they deem crazy in the mental asylum. Captain Yellett obviously had connections with the state. They were in cahoots. He just funded it. Now I'm just giving you one example, the second oldest in fact, but you just have to think, 
these started appearing out of nowhere all around this area around this time. And I mean a lot of asylums. And the typical answer is because of yellow fever, civil war, and syphilis. But as we have gone over the hidden side of things, we see there may be a different agenda at play. All these backstories for these hospitals aren't giving you the whole truth. I mean, just look at this logbook of the West Virginia Hospital for the Insane. This list documents reasons for admission to the institution. I mean, these guys weren't playing around. So these are pretty crazy. If you ran out of money and became homeless, got business trouble, if you got kicked in the head by a horse, I guess that was common back then, imaginary female trouble, an immoral life, not sure what that's supposed to mean, imprisonment, okay, that's kind of scary. If you had your own religious beliefs, or if you were a woman with her own beliefs, that would get you sent to an asylum. Let's see, bad whiskey, okay. <laughs> These institutions don't really care about your health. They were designed for that purpose. These facilities are tools of the state to control a society based on what the controllers deem appropriate. If you overstudied religion, that would get you sent to the institution. Overtaxing mental powers? So if you were too smart, they would get you. Oh, and look, you can get sent in for politics, right? How convenient. I mean, this is a super long list. I'm not going to go over it all, read it over, but... It's just insane. I mean, egotism? How do we even measure that? Someone acts arrogant, they just get thrown into a lunatic asylum? I mean, this kind of became a meme because of some of the weirder, funnier ones, but they would basically throw you into an asylum for any reason that they wanted. It, it could be any reason. They would just throw you in if you were a problem. I mean, just take a look at some of these asylums. Very old world looking, and you know it's not really commonly accepted that there are castles in America, but many of these old asylums and old prisons are literally just that. They just aren't called castles, and we've never looked at them with new eyes. Many of these old asylums share what is called the Kirkbride Plan, which is a system of mental asylum designs advocated by American psychiatrist Thomas Kirkbride. Now, this is the explanation they give on why many of these buildings have similar designs, but could it be that these are actually older world structures, many of them containing underground tunnels and also mud-flooded windows? It's even in the narrative. One good example is Rockwood Asylum, which first we have to look at the Kingston Penitentiary, which if we look at some photos, it looks very old world. This is Canada, but still, you can find the same thing in the US. But the story goes that the Kingston Penitentiary was overrun with medically ill, criminally insane inmates. So to solve this problem, the asylum was built on the shores of Lake Ontario, close to the penitentiary, built by the prisoners themselves. That doesn't make any sense to me, but we're supposed to believe that somehow they made these insane inmates build an asylum for themselves where, by the way, in the Rockwood Asylum, they would literally make people wear uniforms with the label lunatic. And it was also a common practice to drill directly into the skull. So, I mean, yeah, I'm sure they were so excited to build this asylum. Who would have guessed that the mentally insane have the skill to actually build architecture like this? I highly recommend checking out There's No Place Like Home. She has a great video on this subject, so shout out to her. But she goes over this as well, and we see the same thing with the Toronto Insane Asylum. That basically, during this whole 1800s period... The state took it onto their selves to take care for whoever they deemed to be critically insane. As I just showed you with the list, you can imagine how this could go really wrong. The Toronto building has the same dome structure with the stairs that lead up to the entrance, mud flooded windows, and looks like a typical Tartarian building. Another good example is Traverse City State Hospital, which is extremely Victorian looking. It also has a pretty scary feel to it. But they want us to believe that this was built in 1880 in Traverse City, Michigan, when the population at that time was less than 2,000. Why would they need a hospital that big? Because these buildings were used as a means for the state to control the population. And they used old world buildings to create these institutions, as they didn't have the budget or tools to create such detailed structures. I didn't know about this one until recently, but the oldest hospital still in operation in California is the Napa State Hospital in California. Founded in 1872, it has very strange vibes and the entire thing is ginormous. It was originally self-sufficient with its own dairy and poultry ranches, vegetable gardens, orchards, and other farming operations. It basically was its own city and 
this is in North California. Also, many of these facilities have very high security. Anyone and everyone who enters goes through multiple doors, metal detectors, and locked gates. Weird thing is that it doesn't really look anything like it did in the past today. It's still out there in the valley and separated into different units, so I guess they are still using parts of the building, but it looks vastly different than it used to. Keep in mind the San Francisco World Fairs and all of these buildings that they destroyed that had the same exact architecture, and they didn't really have a reason for destroying it. It's also suspicious how they even built it in the first place. Another one is the Greystone Park Psychiatric Hospital, or what was originally called the State Asylum for the Insane at Morristown. This basically is an entire city. It was the largest continuous foundation in the United States from the time it was built until it was surpassed by the Pentagon, and it's around 700,000 square feet. Now, let's take a look at some of the penitentiaries. The Eastern State Penitentiary looks just like a castle to me, it literally has gargoyles. But again, we don't normally think of castles in America, but it's just because we have been given buildings with made up histories and our eyes have become accustomed to just seeing the structures as government buildings or prisons and even colleges. They all have the same story of being built randomly in the early 1800s. I mean, why would you want to make a jail look so fancy? Is this really the most efficient way to build such a structure with the tools and resources available at the time? I mean, we won't even build something like this today. The Kentucky State Penitentiary in Eddyville, Kentucky is nicknamed the Castle on the Cumberland. And another reason that these buildings are castles is that most likely they have been altered and their tops destroyed, so we aren't even seeing the entire building. If we saw it in its entirety, we would see clearly that it was not designed to be a prison. Also. The population of Eddyville, Kentucky in 1880 was less than 500 people, so that doesn't make any sense whatsoever to build such a massive prison. I mean, just imagine if this had steeples on it. This is very out of place for its location and time period. The Anamosa State Penitentiary is also a very unique Victorian architecture in Iowa. If we look at the population at the time, it was less than 3,000 in 1900, so again, it doesn't really add up. The Tennessee State Prison is really insane. It actually reminds me a lot of the Biltmore, which this probably connects more so with many of the old world mansions, but we actually have a little surprise coming out soon. It's going to be big, but back to what I was saying, the Tennessee State Prison was founded in 1832, but as in all these stories, for some reason, they always decide to move the building to a new location. It was either burned down or beyond repair and or they come up with some new plans for some gothic architecture. It supposedly finishes construction in 1898 but it just seems like these were redesignated structures. It's too out of place and seems kind of pointless to spend so much money on these buildings to only last less than 100 years. There are many more of these prisons, but I also think colleges play the same part. I mean, think about what we're talking about. It's all state programming. The asylums, prisons, they were considered to be the same thing before psychiatric hospitals came in, and the schools took a similar approach with compulsory learning and the whole initiative to create a society of workers, not thinkers. So these old world buildings were turned into college institutions as well. Harvard, William & Mary, Columbia University, Yale University, Princeton, St. John's College, Moravian University, Dartmouth College, St. Joseph's University, these buildings and castles have been right in front of our eyes this entire time. These are government-controlled, old-world buildings that were repurposed as mind-control weapons. Each one of these colleges has its own strange narrative that really doesn't add up, but we'll have to save that for another video. Hope you all stay curious, and all we can hope is that our minds will be unveiled. Mm -hmm.